That's all. It'll be Patricia. What'd you say? Um. Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey. I'm um, one of the organizers of the West Coast Climate Action Network, and this is the second of our four part webinar series on transportation in a time of climate crisis. I want to acknowledge that I live personally on the traditional lands of the Shtunemuk and Shtuminas First Nations, that in BC collectively, we live on the lands of more than 200 First Nations, so speaking 60 different languages. And when I first arrived in British Columbia 30 years ago, um, nobody spoke about Indigenous realities or Indigenous rights. I lived in Victoria, there was no trace they'd ever been there. The progress in the last 10 years has been something, in the last one or two years, quite significant, but I've had to learn from scratch all about the Indian Act, about the residential schools, about um, everything. So it's, it's, we're all part of this awakening journey to learn and, and acknowledge. And we really appreciate the, the reality that First Nations have lived on these lands for anywhere between 5,000 and 15,000 years. Our MC today is Mona Dahir, who is an engineering training with Surrey and the district of Surrey, the, the city of Surrey, I think it is, and very engaged with Vision Zero, Safe Mobility Plan. And I'll let Mona take over the rest of the webinar and introduce herself. Welcome, Mona. Thank you, Guy. Hello everyone, my name is Mona Dehir and I'm excited to be your host for this discussion on great walking, cycling, rolling on behalf of the West Coast Climate Action. Uh, as to what Guy was saying, I'm an engineer in training with the Road Safety Vision Zero Surrey team at the City of Surrey. Um, just to plug in about Vision Zero, if you're not aware of it already, Vision Zero is a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. So how, do this, how does this factor into great walking, cycling, rolling, you might ask? We know that vulnerable road users, typically pedestrians and cyclists, are disproportionately impacted by collisions and that they're more likely than other types of road users to be killed or severely injured in a collision, especially when that collision is with a vehicle. A critical part of Vision Zero is to provide safe transportation for all road users, especially our most vulnerable. This takes form in providing protected and separated facilities for pedestrians and cyclists. And this aligns strongly with climate action goals as an effective multimodal system will lead to an increase of pedestrians and cyclists, allowing people to take active transportation trips where they never would have if a safe facility wasn't in place. So with that, Today we present the second in the West Coast Climate Action Network's four-part webinar series on climate or transportation in the time of climate crisis. Um, just a bit more information on the West Coast Climate Action Network. This organization was founded last year and it has 217 organizational members spread across all of BC. Its website at www.westcoastclimateaction.ca. Um, its six teams are busy with various initiatives and it publishes a major newsletter every Friday, so you should definitely sign up. Our focus today, of course, is in this webinar, Great Walking, Cycling and Rolling. And just so you're aware, the next webinar on Wednesday, May 11th, that you should pen in your calendar, will focus on smart communities and trip reduction. And we will finish on June 8th with a focus on car sharing, electric vehicles, cargo bikes, and freight. So in each webinar, we aim to do four things. One, to lay out the best trust transportation policies and solutions for a socially just, inclusive and flourishing British Columbia that uses 100% renewable energy. To write a policy paper that outlines the best policies and solutions both municipally and for the province as a whole. To engage with organizational partners in BC who share the same vision and to send a petition to the relevant political leaders urging specific action. And before we start, as people trickle in, we'd just like to do two quick polls, the first of where do you live? I'm just checking to see if it comes up.
So I'm looking to see, and it seems like the majority of people are from the lower mainland with, and the Vancouver Island, followed by the Kootenai region, uh, Thompson Okanagan, and the Chaco, and one other person in the comments who is from other. So um, we have one more poll for you before we start with the presentations. And this one is just asking if you walk, bike, or roll regularly. So it seems like the majority of participants do walk, bike, or roll regularly with a few people saying sometimes and, and then just a small minority saying rarely or no. And oftentimes that can be because the facilities that we have in our neighborhood aren't comfortable or safe, which makes us less inclined to get out there and use those facilities. With that, um, just as a quick note, we're going to hold questions until after the speakers have made their presentations. Just so you're aware, there's a Q&A Q button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it on the right of participants, and you can enter your questions there. But also note that um, you can also upvote questions. So if you see a question that you wanted to ask, and it's already there, you're probably better off just upvoting it. It'll make its way to the top of the list, and we'll answer the questions in order of priority, and we'll hopefully get to all of them, but we'll do our best. So with that, um, I am proud to present our first speaker, Trish Donnell. Trish Donnell has more than 25 years of experience working with local governments on land use planning, active transportation, community outreach, community energy planning, and policy development. With a team of community volunteers, she is spearheading an incredible initiative to develop a year-round active transportation route linking the West Kootenai communities of Castlegar and Nelson. She is co-chair of the Planning Institute of BC's Climate Action Subcommittee. She believes in collaboration, resourcefulness, and working to keep our communities healthy, livable, and safe for all and for future generations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Trish. Thank, thank you so much, Mona. I want to first off say, walking puts time in my day. That's my mantra. It's my privilege to come to you today from the traditional lands of the Sinaiqs, the Silix, and the Tanaha Nation. I'm here in Brent Nelson, Regional District of Central Kootenai in the Columbia Basin. I travel the traditional routes of the Sinaiqs, following the geography of the land, the rivers, and now railways and highways that link our communities. I'm a self-professed walker sometimes cycler. My ancestors are active transportation enthusiasts, including my Métis voyageur side and my settler explorer surveyor side. I was raised to walk, bike, and paddle for my transportation. I am privileged with my health and the management and the time management strategies I have to be able to continue to walk the talk. Now, especially in the past two years, we've certainly enjoyed the outdoors and exploring, exploring our region by foot and by my pedal bike, which I named Soteria. That's the Greek goddess of safety and preservation from harm. So that's, what, that's how I like to cycle. More on that later. First, let's head to France. In 2007, our family lived in Bordeaux, France. What a year. I learned so much about active transportation in both rural and urban settings. Ma vie, ma ville, mon vélo. That's a Bordeaux slogan. Now, when I announced to a friend that I was moving to Bordeaux, he was serious when he said, I'm sorry, Bordeaux is a horrible place. It's so polluted and ugly. He had been there in the past decade. 2007 was early for Google. And when I tried to do some pre-move research, all I could find was wine. 
good for me, but <laughs> not so great for finding the elementary school for my children or a place to live. However, wow, we arrived in Bordeaux, July 2007, as the Tour de France whizzed by. Also, newly appointed UNESCO World Heritage Site. Apparently, the decade previous, the new mayor upon arrival, replacing a regime that had been in office since World War II. That mayor said, let's green this city fast. Cars were taken off the street. The tramway was it's in the picture there, was put at grade. Um, waterfront was cleaned up and the eco city embraced. At the time, every adult resident, including us with our carte de séjour, had the opportunity to own a free, robust city bike, complete with that comfortable seat and that nice basket, lights. You can have it for up to one year. It gave people the time to learn how to ride bike and incorporate it into your lifestyle. It was a precursor to now the short-term bike rental program that Bordeaux and many cities have in place. And it continues to improve for bikes and public transportation. Last time I was in Bordeaux, a couple of years ago, anecdotally, I noted significantly less cars. Bike education is incorporated into the culture. The Parc Bordelais has a vélo école staffed by a gendarme operating the mini city road. You see that in the picture. It's a road system complete with traffic lights and stop signs and providing safety skills to school children. So we arrived to Bordeaux, what a gem. Yes, there was wine, but also Roman roads, canals, active transportation corridors and a bike friendly experience. Back in Nelson, we're nestled in the Selkirk Mountains along the west arm of Kootenai Lake, population 11,000, area of 7.2 square kilometers. It's hilly, but walkable. Uh, my neighborhood is called Uphill, so that tells you something. Walking puts time in my day. I have transportation choice. I can walk, I take Soteria, my pedal bike, or transit, car share, private vehicle. And no place from Nelson, uh, no place from my home in Nelson is more than four kilometers away. And with my health and budget, and I can budget my time to make walking my choice. All trips start with a walk. That it, This is an inclusive, age-friendly activity. I argue sometimes it's faster to walk. No keys to find, no shoveling, no flat tires, and no parking to find and it's time well spent greeting your neighbors, planning a presentation. Uh, you can even text and walk. And uh, audiobooks. Speaking of such, have you read Lands of Lost Borders? It's a bicycle journey on the Silk Road. It's really a great read. 31% of Nelson residents walked or cycled to work compared to 9% BC average, according to the 2006 census. So we are compact. For our rural neighbors, Nelson does serve a population of 60,000 and we are working on that transportation, active transportation options for them. So I'm a planner. I'm a member of the Planning Institute of BC. Planners aspire to be inclusive and serve all people while respecting the health of our inherited environment. We honor the past, live sustainability in the present, and try not to compromise our future. I like to compare planning to the First Nations seventh generation principle philosophy, where decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. So some planning philosophies found in the local government toolbox in the name of inclusivity and healthy community, sustainable development, age-friendly, truth and reconciliation. Uh, places should be great for an eight-year-old to an 80-year-old. Then it's great for all people, prenatal to the very elderly. Do not build in barriers. 
So meanwhile, back in BC, remember I was riding my bike around Bordeaux in 2007, the provincial legislature introduced the Climate Action Charter. Local government signatories committed to corporate, lead by example, show leadership and work to be carbon neutral in operations. Community, measure and report on your community greenhouse gas emissions, add reduction targets to planning documents, develop plans to achieve these targets, active transportation. Complete, complete, create complete, compact, more energy efficient communities, reduce sprawl, concentrate infrastructure and resources, walkability. Now the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, it reinforces the commitment to active transportation and transit with a target to reduce kilometers driven by personal vehicles by 25% and increase to 30% of trips taking place by walking, cycling, or on public transportation. So local government implement policy to reduce emissions through three key impact areas, buildings, transportation, waste. That's taking climate action, which I see planning for people. Shelter, connection, and health, which is air, food, and water, which becomes waste. So let's plan for people and their needs. With respect to the transportation component of climate action, Clean BC has outlined this order to take action. It starts at the top with the priority actions, behavior change, reduce distance travels, add walking to the daily routine, build compact community. All trips start with a walk or a stroll and all ages and abilities can walk or be walked. And the lower priority actions are to clean the grid, electrify. Keep that in mind as we become EV ready. EVs are only part of the solution. So the bid rent theory, as we move out from the center, land is cheaper, but transportation costs increase. The car made it easy to live further away. We are chasing the land, but travel choice and options become more limited. Cities do offer more transportation choices. Rural transport is beginning to offer more choice. I've always been struck by a, a, a document I read many years ago, The Bicycle, A Vehicle for a Small Planet by Marsha Lowe, 91. Pedal power. And now with e-bikes, we can extend the range and I like to say reduce the signs of aging. We have heard, why fund a bike route? No one uses them. Well, I believe if you build it, they will come. Bike routes will encourage the behavior change and provide the health benefits and an active population. So some policies I thought of, keep connections. We still have a link, for, a link from Nelson to Selma remains. Thankfully, when the BNR railway uh, was removed, it became a linear rail to trail park, despite the adjacent property owners keen to expand their backyards. Plan for the unused road right of ways and undeveloped lanes. Keep them in the public realm. Please don't lose the connections. They can eventually provide green and active links for people and wildlife through the community. And in subdivision, I love the grid system that we have in Nelson, lots of choices. But for cul-de-sacs, ensure there's a pedestrian link that are established through the lots to schools and to shops. Make it easier to walk. With making connections, this policy, in 1996, when the Prestige Resort was built here in Nelson, our OCP said, include a waterfront pathway wherever possible. This became a matter of opinion. I'm pleased to say the pathway won 
and became an impetus to develop a pathway along most of the city's shoreline. In Salmo, volunteers built a pedestrian bridge. It's now faster to walk to school than to drive around. Reduce parking minimums, make it less convenient to park. We are paving paradise. Let's rethink the site plan. Start at the site plan level. Consider the people and their walking route from building to community, bus stop, and even the parking lot. Make it easier to walk and bike and less convenient to park and drive. And I like the Nelson parking brochure we have out that shows walking times from the park and ride lots to help. That helps change behavior and realize it's, it's not that far to walk. Some sidewalk policy suggestions. Keep the sidewalks, have plans, repair them, don't remove them. Clear the sidewalks, keep the bus shelters clear from snow. One shouldn't need to have to be an athlete to climb the snowbank to wait safely for the bus. And I thank this property owner for clearing that, that uh, bus shelter. Accessible. Keep accessibility in mind. Don't build in barriers or direct pedestrians into the middle of the intersection, as these curb aprons do. Age friendly. While repairing potholes for cars, remember the tripping hazards for our population that is not driving that are on the sidewalks. Some more policies lead by example. You can add e-bikes to your corporate fleet. Uh, Nelson has a bike loan program. Uh oh, lost my notes. Uh, well, um, the West Kootenays has a grade four or five cycling education program. Remember the gendarme at Bordeaux. I like this uh, Kingston Transit High School program, free bus passes, building transit independence in, um, within students. Uh, and mind the pedestrian. At the bottom of the transportation action ladder, when we do electrify and get our communities EV ready, remember the people. Do not compromise, obstruct the sidewalks with courts and infrastructure. A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. That's our mantra as we in the, as I, I lead a, a dedicated group of volunteers to work to bring into reality the dream of an accessible active transportation route, 45 kilometers between Nelson and Castlegar. Ta-da, there's our vision. We're uh, creating an integrated alternate transportation op option to get from Castlegar to Nelson and thereabouts. It even includes an electric train someday and all the stops. So it's been said, given time and money, anything is possible. With the development of active transportation infrastructure, I believe the results to be for the individual cost-effective, think gas prices and vehicle ownership, and for shorter distance, time effective. For the community, this is win-win for the mental and physical health of population and individuals. It is priceless. Thank you. <laughs> Over to you, Mona. Thank you, Trish. What a, what a beautiful presentation. I feel, I feel pretty inspired hearing all of that, just remembering that we, we need to plan for the people and you know, hopefully we can lead by example and just do just that. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. So um, moving on to our uh, next presenter, I would, I am honored to uh, introduce Iona Bonami. Iona Bonami is a senior transportation planner with a master's of science in community and regional programming from UBC. And, has, and she has more than 13 years of experience as an urban planner. Over this time, she's worked on a broad array of active transportation and transit projects in Vancouver, North Vancouver, and other Canadian communities. She and her partner have never owned a vehicle, 
which is awesome. And they mainly travel with their two young kids by walking and cycling. And when they do need a vehicle, they use car share. And just to sort of plug in, Iona has a website that is www.ionabonami.ca. And now I will turn it over to Iona. Thanks, Mona. Um, I'll share my screen as well here. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Mona. Um, so as uh, Mona mentioned, my name is Iona Bonami, uh, but my traditional Chinese name is Si Wing. Uh, that's what my parents call me and uh, what my family calls me. Um, and I am currently a senior transportation planner and I'm currently working at the city of Vancouver. Um, but it's important to note, I am not speaking on behalf of the city uh, today. Um, it's more of me as an individual who has been in the planning practice for a number of years, kind of speaking on my experience. Um, also make a plug uh, that I am also running for city council in this year's fall election um, as part of the One City uh, Party. And today I will be using Vancouver as an example of some of the infrastructure, cycling infrastructure and active transportation infrastructure that has been built over the last little while uh, as an illustration of what's been happening in many other urban environments and then use that as a way to illustrate what we could do uh, moving forward. Um, I also, for at uh, move on, I should say that I am very, uh, uh, grateful to be able to live, work, and play from um, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, very grateful to be able to raise my two kids with my partner here. So uh, now going back into my slides. So in 2009 in Vancouver, there was a relatively good network of local bikeways throughout the city. They were comfortable for for most people, um, but Within the downtown, there was only a seawall route that was separated. There weren't any direct connections into the heart of downtown. So the vast majority of jobs were not really accessible for people who want to bike and want to be safe and comfortable. So starting in, in 2009, the city started installing separated protected bike facilities. We have Carroll Street Bikeway, and then in 2009, we started with the Burrard Bridge having separated bike facilities on there. And at this time, the city's cycling mode share was only about 3%. And there was, this was quite a controversial project at the time for people who are familiar with it. There are a lot of people who were concerned about taking away road space from vehicles and giving it to uh, cyclists. And people were doubtful if it would actually be used. And as you can tell, um, it has been a very popular route. Many people use it on a daily basis now. So fast forward to 2019, 10 years later, the city now has installed a number of other protected bike facilities into downtown. Um, this included the Hornby and Dunsmuir bikeway, uh, bike paths, the Comox Greenway, Canby and Beatty, uh, Smythe and Nelson. Also, there was a south connection here at Broad Bridge to Cornwall, um, massive intersection improvement there. And with these changes, um, I think a big part of it uh, was due to these changes, the cycling mode share for the city increased by three times and it's been sitting at around 9% since then. Today, now we have even more protected bike facilities. We have Richard Street, we have Pacific, and we also have Beach Avenue, which is a new bike route that's been provided through COVID to provide additional separation for people walking and cycling. As part of the, this protected cycling network, protected intersections were also introduced in a number of locations. And the protected intersection design is adopted from the Netherlands. They allow vehicles, or bikes to be separated from vehicles as they're passing through the intersection. These corner islands pr provide this protection from vehicles that are turning. And they provide this space that vehicles can use 
to wait if they are there are pedestrians and people cycling across the intersection so they can wait here before turning and if it's large enough it reduces the pressure because they can just sit here and wait while the through traffic behind them can pass through there is a waiting area for bikes to queue and there's also a waiting area for pedestrians to queue and there's also signal phasing so that provides advanced and separated signal phases for people walking and cycling and people driving and the, so this design it really changed things um, made a lot of intersections much safer this is an example of a protected intersection that was recently built on richards and pacific street in downtown this is the corner island and this is the area where people can walk uh, who are walking can wait and then this is the waiting area for people who are cycling now, and as you can see the crossing distance it's much it is much shorter now as well so all of that is to say that a lot has been done to connect people to their jobs places of employment and to connect to people people to downtown and through downtown. What still needs to be addressed are non-commuting trips, recreational trips, and areas outside downtown. When we look at Vancouver's 2019 and 2020 data, there, show, there is a significant increase in demand for non-commuting trips by active transportation. When we looked at 2019 and 2020, during the peak AM and PM, commuting times, while the number of trips dropped because of COVID, because of the pandemic, um, dropped by about 40% during those times, the reduction in trips was a lot less between the non-commuting times, the regular non-commuting times between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And also shopping trips increased as a percentage of all trips taken from 10 to 15%. And we also know the bike number of bike trips grew significantly, particularly on the weekends, and despite the reduction overall reduction in commuting trips. So this is not just unique to Vancouver. It, we have been seeing this in many, many places across the world. The number of people walking and cycling has risen um, during COVID and the number of kilometers being traveled has significantly increased by walking and cycling. So do we have the demand, do we have the infrastructure to meet this demand though? This is a map that shows the existing cycling network in Vancouver. Those are shown with the green lines and then the yellow lines are the uh, what we're calling the AAA or All Ages and Abilities Network. And the blue dots show the retail destinations. And as you can see, in most cases, the retail destinations are not well connected to the cycling network. They may be a block off or so, they may be a block away, but they're not directly connected. So what if we shifted our focus now from commuting, serving commuting trips to non-commuting trips? Well, I would argue that would create a more equitable and inclusive city by focusing our needs on women, older adults, children, and people with mobility challenges, because these groups are more likely to make these non-commuting trips. So trips to the shop, park, trails, cafes, restaurants, etc. And we know that the women, number of women and older adults cycling are growing, but there's still a ways to go. Again, going back to Vancouver in 2020, 11% of men cycled, while only 5% of women cycled. And the percentage of out older adult cycling was even lower. In Vancouver, 9% of people ages four to five, to, uh, ages four to five to 65 cycled, while only 6% of people ages 65 and plus biked. And when we looked at the overall region, Metro Vancouver, only 0.5% of people ages 65 and 79 cycled. So if we were to great, have a greater focus on non-commuting trips, I believe that there's a really great potential for these trends to change. Um, and what if we also looked at areas outside downtown? 
This is a map um, that is um, part of the draft Vancouver plan. It shows the concentration of disproportionately impacted uh, populations uh, within different areas of the city. And of the darker the color, it means there's a higher concentration of people experiencing systemic barriers. And these include people of visible minority, indigenous identity, people are rent burdened, low income individuals, single parent families. And so if we were to focus our efforts outside the downtown, as you can see, I think we would hit more of the people, we would be serving the needs of people who, are, have, who have historically been facing these barriers to access to jobs and, and parks and, and other daily amenities. So what is needed to make this shift? Well, you can probably guess it's more of a citywide network of safe pedestrian cycling facilities that connect people to their daily needs, such as the grocery stores and the restaurants and medical offices, the schools and parks. And of course, the Netherlands have done a great job of doing that. Uh, in many cities now, they have really transformed their streets over the last few decades so that vehicles are treated as, as guests, particularly on local streets. Um, and the road space has been given back to people walking, cycling and gathering. On streets where vehicle speeds are higher, so 50K or more, they have protected bike facilities and as, um, make sure that the uh, walking facilities are also protected. And at the intersections, the pedestrians and cycling paths are continuous, they're raised and they're prioritized so that vehicles having to pass through these, cross these paths, they have to go up and, and they're, it provides a signal to them that they have to slow down. Uh, another important element is lighting, having really well lit facilities that improve people's sense of security so that they're still able to continue to bike and walk in the evening and in the winter. Um, the Netherlands have also found that uh, many older adults are continuing to bike uh, in, in their older ages. And they found that wider bike facilities are really important to make sure that they are safe and comfortable. And then another really uh, common thing that we see in many cities, uh, city centers, not just in the Netherlands, are car-free streets. They're completely car-free, so people don't have to worry about any conflict with a vehicle at all. And here are some more examples outside Netherlands. We have Car Free Street in Barrio Chino neighborhood in Mexico City on the top left. And on the bottom center is a pedestrian only street in Stockholm that is commercial, um, very, very well used, lots of commercial activity happening there. And then this is a street where walking, cycling and transit is prioritized. And this is again in Stockholm. Now, these illustrations basically, basically show that it's not a new concept, but it is probably still a bit newer in, in, in BC and North America. Um, those places though, you know, they took several decades to make the changes. They encountered many of the same challenges that we do, we have today. Um, and today we, you know, we still see a lot of people seeing pedestrian cycling facilities being mutually exclusive. If you have a, a sidewalk, you may not have enough space for a bike lane, but a bike lane adjacent to a sidewalk helps provide buffer for, for the pedestrians from vehicles. And bike lanes also reduce cycling on sidewalks. In downtown Vancouver, uh, bike lanes show that there's been an 80% reduction in sidewalk cycling. Meanwhile, on commercial streets that don't have bike lanes, people continue to ride on them. Uh, as well, we continue to hear from businesses who are not completely convinced about the benefits of having cycling infrastructure. And some people still see bike lanes as a reason for increased congestion and reduced parking availability. And on the right here, there's an example of uh, some residents who are opposed to uh, the bike lanes on Cook Street in Victoria. But we have some really positive results, benefits that we can point to. In the Netherlands, with the changes they've done, communities are now more accessible. Seniors and children can travel independently without fear of conflicts with cars. 
cycling facilities are not just used by people who are cycling, but also people with mobility devices. And they found that 56% of their cyclists are women and 25% of people ages 65 and older still cycle. And people who have to drive, they found that with the reduced vehicle volumes on their roads, there's less congestion to deal with. So they are still able to get around more easily. And perhaps more importantly, communities are now more connected with a stronger sense of social cohesion because people have a lot more opportunities to come in contact with each other as they're walking and cycling on their streets. In Canada, we also have some great positive results that we can point to in downtown Vancouver, the BIA and their members now embrace cycling. In Toronto, the Bloor Street bike lanes are now being extended. The percentage of customers cycling to the area has tripled and the visitors are more likely to spend more money. 48% um, are more likely to spend $100 or more and the merchants have reported an increase in customers. In Montreal, we have also seen a an expansion of their pedestrian streets. And this is supported by their business development association. And the quote, this is a quote from the association, pedestrian streets have become essential meeting places, creating social ties and a sense of belonging that are essential to the vitality and well-being of our neighborhoods. So I think this really sums it up that there are all of, a lot of great benefits to having more active transportation facilities within all across a, a city. And while there may be challenges, there, as Trish has mentioned, I think there are so many benefits that we can point to. But thank you for your time. Um, this is my um, email address that you can use if you want to contact me afterwards. And as Mona mentioned, I also have a website that you can visit with more information. Thank you. Thanks for the great uh, presentation, Ayana. I especially appreciated your points. Like there are many benefits to building cycling facilities, but also that when we go and do that, we need to make sure that we also build them also where they're needed most as well. And knowing that the facilities that we tend to build, which are for commuter trips, don't always align with the off-peak non-commuting trips that seniors and whoever mothers they choose to take, right? So. Thank you for that, we appreciate it very much. And um, on to our third presenter, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Thibner. Tom Thibner brings 15 years of public sector experience to the Watt Consulting Group's transportation division where he is the active transportation lead and regional lead for the Vancouver studio. His work, has his work has included developing mobility bike share programs, developing complete streets, and changing public perceptions through strategic communications, education, encouragement, and enforcement. His experience within the public sector has given him unique insights into how to deliver complex projects. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom now. Uh, awesome. Uh, is my audio and presentation working okay, Mona? Sounds good. We can see your screen. Awesome. Thank you. And great to see you again. Uh, so I am going to share a little bit of uh, my experience and travels. Um, I've been really inspired so far by both the presentations. And I think you just made it a lot easier for me when it comes to the election, who I'm going to vote for. So great job, Iona. Uh, I definitely respect the work that you put in. I, too, have been on the front lines uh, as a municipal planner, as a bike pedestrian planner for uh, about 15 uh, years. It's been uh, definitely a challenge everywhere I've worked. Um, I, I originally got my start at the city of Tucson in Arizona, about an hour north of the border with Mexico. Uh, that's my hometown, and uh, it's a community with a great bike culture. I was the sixth ever person to get hired to be the bike pedestrian coordinator there. Uh, they originally established the position in the 1980s. And so Tucson's got a rich bike culture, but in, uh, from 2000 uh, to 2005, when I started, Tucson went from being the number one community in the US with the highest commuting bike share, bike mode share split, even above Portland to uh, being number 12 by 2005. It really had just kind of rested on its basic network of uh, having striped bike lanes on the major roads and nothing else. 
And uh, so I took a little bit, I took a look around and said, you know what, we can do some things to make it easier uh, for regular people to bike and walk. And there's a lot of barriers, but I started working with the community. And one of the first things I did was establish uh, an open streets event called Ciclovia. And that was modeled after Bogota's famous event where they closed down a bunch of streets on a Sunday and allow people to experience uh, what it's like to ride or walk without the threat of cars. And so um, it took a, a little while before this event took off, but uh, it is now really rolling and they get about 40,000 people per event. Even though I've, I've handed off the reins many years ago, it's uh, become a tradition in Tucson. And it's the only place where you can uh, see people walk, bike, uh, see marching bands, mariachis, and get tacos all at the same place. So it's kind of a fun event. Uh, I worked on a lot of infrastructure there too. I helped build a low stress network of bike boulevards and uh, the, the bike mode split is now increasing and then Tucson's up to number six in the nation and still you know, behind cities like Portland, uh, but making good ground. Uh, in 2012, I relocated to Canada and became Calgary's first ever cycling coordinator. And that was really fun because uh, in the States at the time, uh, you know, they were in a recession. There was no more budget to work on things. And Calgary had just adopted a, a really aggressive cycling strategy policy and had $20 million of capital and funding for three new positions. And I was the first person hired. And then I was able to develop my team and really just start tackling some of the issues there. And the big issues were just the lack of infrastructure on street, great pathway system, thousand kilometers, but almost um, you know less than 50 kilometers of bike lanes. So including in the downtown where you just had this donut of infrastructure, lots of destinations, shopping, uh, commercial office, residential, but very little connections. And so, I was uh, privileged to get to become the project coordinator of the famous uh, cycle track pilot, which tackled three corridors all at the same time and put, putting in protected bike infrastructure on each of those corridors. And boy, did that do uh, marvelous things for Calgary. Uh, we managed to double the number of trips by bike coming in and out of downtown and also double the trips citywide because at the same time we were doing this, I was working on other corridors to put in complete streets type of improvements. Uh, so that's a bit about me and my background. Um, I'm just a little bit worried about that today's solutions are, we're not aggressive enough. And, and uh, you know, we do have investments going towards transit. Uh, that is great, but our community should be designed around rapid transit so that people across the region can travel faster than a passenger vehicle can. And the SkyTrain is awesome that way. And I think that's uh, the way we should go, but we need to have more investments in rapid transit to happen if we're gonna be more sustainable. Our roadways still uh, prioritize cars and trucks almost entirely exclusively on the major roadways. Uh, transit loses some of its impact when it's forced to contend with passenger vehicles. And of course, people walking and biking uh, don't find much pleasure in street designs like this, where you have to mix with, uh, with traffic. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm a little disappointed with the lack of progress uh, locally since moving to Vancouver. Um, you know, there's a real great opportunity with the Broadway project to put transit underground. That's definitely uh, a huge improvement. But the new route road design could be better. And this kind of gets into what Iona was saying as we haven't tackled some of the commercial streets. And Broadway is a great commercial corridor with lots of room, but the bikes, people rolling are still going to be relegated to the side streets or going on down the sidewalk, which creates conflicts for pedestrians. And protected bike lanes are great, but they're often on the side streets like like uh, 10 tabs, so it's parallel. So you're not always gonna be able to get to the destination that you want to, which in, in truth limits the amount of uh, potential uh, trips that could be done by people rolling. And most major roads look like this or, or even less, you're just forced to share the road or, share, you know, or ride next to motor vehicles. 
And so this is the, the road leading into Stanley Park. And uh, yeah, I've seen a five-year-old biking on this street and it's a little bit scary because there's buses and big cars going by at the same time. And uh, like Mona said, most of our streets are designed for peak hour travel. And then when you plan that way, it leaves just the scraps for people walking and biking and you don't end up with much space and most of the right of way goes towards moving cars or storing them. I think electric vehicles can help, but there are limitations. Uh, obviously, most people can't afford a, an electric vehicle. Um, logistically, it's gonna take a lot of charging stations to make this work in BC. It can take anywhere from 30 minutes to six hours to charge a car. And uh, you know, there's gonna be this, well, where can I charge my car? It's just not practical. It takes, you have to charge the whole car. Um, and I'm gonna get back to a, a potential solution to that in just a minute. But the other problem with EVs is they're not a silver bullet. They still pollute. There's tire wear and particulates that are released. And the big thing that I'm worried about is they weigh a lot more. They're already heavy because they're passenger vehicles, but 30% more because of the additional weight with the batteries. So this is gonna be a problem for pedestrians. Um, obviously, if we can get the speeds down on uh, vehicles driving, that's gonna help a lot. But I don't really see this as being a, a solution for trips under five kilometers, which over half of the trips um, that people in British Columbia are producing are less than five. So we need a little inspiration. I'm gonna bring a couple examples from my travels and work. Um, a couple of years ago in 2017, I was lucky enough to uh, take a sabbatical after the cycle track project and live in Taiwan, uh, where my partner's from. And uh, I got to spend about seven months in Taipei. And Taipei is a fascinating bustling city with a mix of old and new and mobility is just everywhere. It's, it's, it's exploding as you uh, walk around, bike around. Most people are getting around by motor scooters. Uh, just like these motorbikes at the Costco in this picture here. And uh, yes, you can pick up an 18 inch gigantic cheese pizza and take it home on your motorbike. You can also pack in the boxes, the same stuff that you get at the Costco's here. I've seen people really load up the scooters and it's not uncommon to see four or five people on a single one. And these are somewhat sustainable. They take a little bit of gas and they move people. They're really affordable. You can get, get one for two to $5,000. So families really latch on to these things uh, and they don't take much space to store them. Uh, and the scooters are so popular that the city's installed scooter lanes. And uh, these are really handy because obviously the scooter is not going as fast as a car, but they're going a lot faster than a normal bicycle and definitely a lot faster than somebody walking. And so you see a network of these lanes pop up and usually they try to separate bikes. And so sometimes you see them side by side, like uh, with the scooters on the left in this case, and then the bikes on the right. But the most exciting thing I saw a couple of years ago when I went back for a visit was uh, the conversion of these gas powered scooters to electric. And you don't, the beauty of this system is you don't have to charge the scooter, you just charge the batteries that go into it. And uh, this company called Gogoro is going pretty big over there. They now have um, 20, 2,200 stations. And basically, you know, these are just uh, popped up. Um, they're really narrow. They're just on the, you know, on the sidewalk basically where there's extra space. And you can find them via a smartphone app and you lift up your seat and there's two batteries. And then once you see kind of, okay, my, my, my juice is getting low, time to go find some new batteries. You just kind of use your app and go find where they're at. And then it takes 30 seconds. So compare that to six hours to charge your car, it takes 30 seconds to swap your batteries and just keep yourself moving because time is important to everyone, of course. Um, and it works like a, a cell phone program, like where you just kind of pick your plan and then, you know, you pay anywhere from $18 a month to $40, depending on how many times you're going to charge. And uh, Taiwan didn't have this five years ago, and then it just exploded. And now it's everywhere across the island. And there's more charging stations than gas stations. Uh, so it's quite amazing how this is picked up and that company's now uh, moved into mainland China and India. And I'm just 
really optimistic that that's going to help some of those developing countries uh, to not emulate us and buy Buicks and big vehicles. Uh, I think these two wheelers have potential for the, the longer distance trips across regions. Uh, Taipei is a sprawling area, so it works well there. They've, uh, Taipei in Taiwan is, is a pretty amazing place transportation wise. They have high speed rail that moves people across the uh, north south on the island, uh, you know, 300 kilometers an hour. They've got an MRT system that shoots people across the city uh, with multiple uh, stations. And then they've got this great bike share system, similar to the one in Bordeaux, where uh, you know, I think they have five to 6,000 bikes um, and it's all integrated with one payment scheme. So you could use the same card for the train as you can for the bikes. It's a beauty and, and you actually get a discount when you combine trips, uh, super affordable. Um, you can check out a bike for, you know, 50 cents to a dollar. It's cheaper than the actual transit fare. It's great. And now Taipei is starting to deal with its on-street infrastructure needs. Because if you introduce all these people onto bike share bikes, you got to start clawing back some space. And this is one example where they took a lane away to shrink it down. And I think, you know, even though it's dense Taipei, they have plenty of right of way and opportunity to shrink those roads. And they're doing a good job of starting to separate people walking from biking and rolling as well as from the cars. Um, switching gears over to Calgary, just from a couple um, experiences from my time there. Um, this is kind of as a, a counter to the Broadway project in Vancouver. Calgary just completed uh, construction on Bonus Road. Um, I implemented uh, and built phase one and two. Phase three just got finished and it's the most exciting part because it went through a historic uh, commercial area, a high street, and it's really tight. Um, there's 16,000 cars going down this street. It has bus rapid transit, articulated buses, and uh, a lot of pedestrian needs, shopping, loading, as well as bike demand, but there was no bike lanes before. And, and the city to their credit pulled it off and they retrofitted the street and balanced everything. And you know, there's 16,000 cars on the street, but just two lanes to move them and that's enough. And so we have to really look at narrowing our roadways to make this happen. And at the same time, they got in street trees, which are really vital for walkability, especially with climate change. You know, the summers are gonna be unbearable and hot in British Columbian cities, and we need to do more to provide a little shade for people walking. Um, and then that big cycle track pilot that I talked about at the beginning that I was a part of was, was awesome. It cost only $5 million. We reallocated 2% of the overall lanes and downtown streets to move people on bike. Uh, not only did people on bikes use them, but people on wheelchairs were using them. It was a fabulous investment. And each year we basically saw 1 million trips happen. It really got ridership levels up. Um, and then the last thing I did in Calgary before I left was set the stage for the e-scooter pilot. So, we, I got to work with the province of Alberta to relax the regulations in the Motor Vehicle Act and then set up the system, the regulations to allow a pilot where we could regulate e-scooter operators. And so Calgary was actually the first city in Canada to allow them to operate on street. And boy, did it take off like uh, wildfire. Uh, they, the, the, just so you know, the, you know, an e-bike system, a shared system might get you three to five trips per day per device. The scooters will get you about anywhere from seven to nine trips. They're just very popular with people and they're very good for trips that are around a kilometer. So if you're thinking about short distances, boy, those things are fast and uh, very fun to do that last, uh, last kilometer on. And some of the things that we learned from the Calgary experience was that over half of the trips began or ended in those commercial shopping streets. And so it was very interesting to see that. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about trying to get more bike infrastructure on those streets, because it's important to separate people traveling 20 kilometers an hour from people walking five kilometers an hour and driving as well. And the other exciting thing happening in Alberta is they're working on passenger rail uh, to go from Calgary airport to Banff. 
So that's going to do wonders to get uh, buses and motor vehicles off the roads to connect airports straight to uh, the number one tourist destination out there. And I hope we see more passenger rail out here to places like Whistler or uh, in Victoria, uh, where they've got you know, existing rail line. So just to summarize, um, you know, it takes a, a lot of political will and strong leaders to persevere. There's going to be a, a bike lash, there's going to be resistance along the way, but if you've got the right leaders and they stay firm and committed, you can pull off anything. Um, you know, it was disappointing to see Vancouver miss out on this opportunity to pass, uh, to charge a nominal fee for parking private automobiles on public streets uh, would have created a lot of revenue for um, active transportation. Uh, funding is pretty limited in the province currently. Uh, they only spend about $14 million per year on uh, projects. And just for comparison, that Great Richard Street example that Iona brought up cost about the same amount. So if you wanna build a street right, you're gonna need about 10 million a kilometer to do that. And, the province just doesn't have anywhere near enough money to cover that. So the, the call for at least $100 million is like, we really need at least that. Uh, but the other thing that funding should go for and its city should consider is it takes staff. And this is just a graph from uh, the League of American Bicyclists who are the main uh, lobbyists in the US for more investments. And they uh, have definitive data that says if the more staff you have, you're, you're basically four, you're 10 times more likely to have a, a high bike commuter share than cities without staff. So it's substantial, most places forget about it. Um, and uh, yeah, when we, I just finished a job at the, for the town of Esquimalt and that was one of our big five recommendations besides fixing infrastructure and doing a quick build cycle, cycling network and lowering speed limits was, add some staff because the existing staff can't do it alone. If you want to jumpstart things, add a couple more bodies. And of course, it depends on your size of your community, but don't forget them. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is like the BC Motor Vehicle Act is so out of date. Everybody knows we got to reform it, but uh, doesn't seem to be moving very fast. All these new vehicles, micro mobility vehicles, uh, bikes, pedestrians, we're all at the bottom and, and barely mentioned and we all you know, we're all beholden to the motor vehicle still. So I hope to see a bottoms up approach where they put peds first and then bikes next. Uh, but uh, yeah, we got to push for it. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Tom, much appreciated. I think uh, just looking at the comments, there are some people who are big fans of uh, EV scooters. I, I recently bought a e-scooter myself so I could uh, replace some of my car trips. But um, yeah, and I just know there's some people maybe commenting on the cost of some of these programs. So maybe in the q and if they can just put it in there and then we can probably talk about that as well as a user of the system. And yeah, thank, thank you again, Tom, much appreciated. Um, just to one other thought you mentioned, just that it is important to have good public transit to get people out of cars and public transit and walking and cycling, rolling, they do complement each other. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, I will introduce uh, Guy Doncier, co-chair of the West, Climate, West Coast Climate Action to Network to introduce the policy paper and the public petition. Thanks, Mona. Um, Thomas, can you stop the screen sharing at your end? And then we'll, because um, when we do these webinars, we're not just about getting the inspiring ideas and stuff like that. We're also very much about changing the world. And so with each of the webinars, we have um, a policy paper and we have a petition coming up. So I'm just gonna share with you, the this is the policy paper we put together for this um, webinar. And at the end of it, it's got a petition. So in light of the arguments that whereas walk-in and cycle are inclusive, affordable, healthy, joyful, et cetera, and produce zero climate pollution, and that the clean, the clean BC roadmap 2030 sets a goal to double active transportation. I don't think I'm sharing, am I? Yes, I am. Is it? Is, is my sharing coming yeah. across? Because your sharing's coming across. Yeah. Yep. The goal to double that whole screen, but it works. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll just correct that. There we go. 
um, set a goal to double active travel modes share and to reduce travel distances by 25% by 2030. Bloody, 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 blah. Let me look at how much money the government's actually investing. Less than 1% of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure's $2.7 billion budgets going on active transportation. And yet transportation is doing 40% of our climate pollution. So we're calling on the government to establish a plan to achieve the BC 2030 active transportation mode share targets and to increase the provincial active transportation program funding from 20 million a year to 100 million a year and the maximum for one project of 5 million by reallocating funds from existing highway expansion projects. And Sebastian will put the, I'll put the link to that in the chat, first of all, to the, um, to the policy paper. And Sebastian, if you can share, we have the petition, we're going to launch the petition, so we're all rolling to go and get you signing this petition. When we've gathered enough petitions and we'll have organizations signing on as well, we will actually then see just two of us signed so far. So there you go, you're right at the beginning. We will be calling, having a meeting with the minister um, to present the petition to him and, and hopefully get this really front and center on the budget next February. Back to you, Mona. Thanks, Guy. So I think now we're just going to have, uh, I guess, one last poll before we go to the Q&A. And um, this poll is just asking that, do you support the need for a five-fold increase in funding for active transportation to 100 million annually by reallocating funds from highway expansion projects? Which as Guy has mentioned was part of the petition. <laughs> so, no surprise here, I think. So um, hopefully uh, after the webinar, um, you can all go and uh, sign on to the petition and uh, support it. So thank you. So now we're just going to move into the Q&A part of our session. And I'm just going to pull the questions up. So I will start with this first question from John. And um, just to make it a bit easier, I may just ask the speakers to just raise their hands if they'd like to answer, and then I can just call on you to answer the question. So the first question is, um, how can we ensure that active transportation design includes amenities like washrooms, fountains, and benches at regular intervals and not rely on businesses for that? Don't all jump. One of you gets scared. <laughs> <laughs> I think Iona's raised her hand. Yeah, I think um, that is a very important point. And uh, these types of amenities are often lacking in so many of our communities. Um, and it's not just the capital funding that's missing, but also the operating funds to keep them going. Uh, and I think that's a lot of actually that's a big barrier for many communities to operate them it takes even more than to as particularly for washrooms um, it's even bigger than the capital cost so um, I think that is an important part of the city's budget and uh, communities budgets that need to be uh, designated so that you have those funds available to to provide these facilities really important facilities Absolutely, thank you, Ayana. And oh, and uh, I think Trisha's raised her hand. I just wanted to add, we have um, Kootenai Adaptive Sport that's on our sort of dream visioning team and really reminding us don't build in barriers. So we're at the vision stage, but absolutely think about um, fountains and bathrooms and benches along the way as part of the, the plan. And um, that just keeps reminding me of age-friendly communities and vision and yeah we can't all walk three kilometers we, we need some benches on the way so thanks thank you trish so i may just um john i'm seeing a lot of questions from you in here so i may just um mix it up a little bit just so i can get to everybody's questions at least once so We'll come back to you for sure, but I just want to make sure we at least try to address one question from everybody on the list. So 
The next question we have here is in the transportation hierarchy with walking, rolling and biking being on top, has there ever been a time where you've had to consider transit being given priority over multi-use pathways? It's a big, big one. Um, I'll take a stab. There's always competing demands on roadways. Um, I think if uh, there's policy support that says this is a uh, critical corridor for transit, they're probably going to take priority over the other modes. Uh, most traffic engineers I've worked with are pretty, uh, they're pretty good about that and making sure that those needs are met. The active transportation users, uh, whether it's on street or on a pathway is usually kind of like dependent on what's left. And so that's the unfortunate thing is, uh, you know, it seems, I think, you know, even if there is a policy that suggests that bikes and peds are on top, often the traffic engineers, not to blame them for everything, but they will tend to make sure that moving automobiles is checked off first and then transit and then the other users. Thanks, Tom. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I completely agree, Thomas, and, and in my experience that uh, it is often easier um, to make that argument for transit than to have adequate space for people walking and cycling. Um, so yeah, as you said, while the policy might say these modes are prioritized in this way, it doesn't necessarily happen uh, when it comes down to actually designing uh, a road space. Thank you, Ayana. <clears throat> we'll move on to the next uh, question by Douglas. Um, isn't it time for a celebration of active transportation that the weekly model of Cyclovia could provide for Vancouver and other BC communities like every Sunday example in Mexico City? Well, you, you heard my response earlier. <laughs> you know, honestly, uh, the Tucson experience, uh, it only happens uh, two times a year there. It's resource intensive. Each event honestly costs about $200,000 to do all the mobilization and staff time. Uh, so they don't just happen spontaneous. They take a lot of resources. Um, but Bogota, Mexico City, um, you know, they're done in all the major cities in Latin America almost on a weekly basis, if not weekly. Uh, Los Angeles has one three or four times a year. Uh, places have figured out, and from the Tucson experience, it's a game changer in terms of just opening up people's eyes to how easy it could be uh, if they just tried it out on that, that day. And so much fun at the same time. I'll add in little old Nelson here, we have a very wonderful active transportation. Uh, she's the vice president of our uh, West Kootenai Cycling Coalition. Salita work, thanks Salita. She just on earth hour, just by herself, decided to have a bike rave and she got us all to wear our lights and you know high vis gear. And we paraded around Nelson in the dark during um, Earth Hour. There was 20 people there. She just pulled it off. She has a nice little bike with a trailer and some music. And it was awesome. So um, you, you need a, a lovely uh, Salida in your community to do it. But she just she just pulled it off real fast. And she used to live in Calgary, so I know her well. Oh, you know her. <laughs> she is awesome. And one of the engines behind all the advocacy there. So you're luck lucky to have her. We are, and sorry to name you Salita, but you're a, you're a superstar. Wonderful, I hope I get to meet Salita one day. She sounds wonderful. She is. Um, so um, moving on to the next question by, um, apologies if I get your name wrong, but um, Morino Zanotto. Um, commercial shopping areas on arterials and cycling facilities tend to be on local streets, bikeways, blocks away from the artery, not very convenient. The circular argument of not enough cyclists to warrant removing parking or a travel lane on a major street, but we have trouble building cycling volumes unless we provide a fine-grained cohesive network, including protected facilities on arterial roads. And I 
this is definitely a philosophy question. How do we make that shift? Yes, Ayana? Um, yeah, I would definitely agree with those statements. And um, it's something that, um, as I had said, it's not quite, you know, on many of our arterial streets in, in, in the lower mainland, um, yeah, we don't have that connection. We don't have the bike facilities there to connect people to those uh, destination. So I think it takes political will, um, as Thomas had said, um, to, to really push for that. And um, as a planner, I mean, I think um, it's really important to bring people along as well to explain the benefits. Um, I talked about the, some of the benefits that other cities have seen when they've put in these facilities. So I think it's really important to point to those. And um, it really shows that you know, when you build it, they will come. Um, it's not just something, you know, we say and it's like fluffy, but there's actual evidence of that. Um, I think I'll add to that by saying there's some new data that just came out from the SFU Chatter Lab, uh, Dr. Megan Winters um, and another lady, I can't remember her name, but they just did a very deep survey of Vancouver residents, Metro Vancouver residents, and found that 8% of Vancouverites now own an e-bike. And another 5%, I believe it's 5% own an e-scooter. So, you know, e-bikes and e-scooters really just started coming online a couple of years ago. And if that continues to grow, my goodness, watch out. I think Vancouver is getting close to a tipping point where we could really see the, the bike mode split double. Um, you know, just think, just look at the numbers in Europe. Uh, in, you know, some of the cities, have atrocious numbers like 2% bike mode split and some have 30%, 40%. And I think Vancouver could be getting close to that, but yeah, it's gonna take a little political will and more funding. <laughs> Thank you, Ayana and Tom. Um, the next question from uh, Tara Skur, who says, thanks to the presenters who've spoken. Um, she lives in the Comox Valley, lands at the land of the SUVs and pickup truck. <laughs> Very little public transit here, although increasing the use of e-bikes among older adults. I'd love to hear ideas for helping to educate the community about safety risks for pedestrians and cyclists from SUVs and trucks. Are there resources that presenters could point to? She'd love to support our climate-focused city council candidates this election cycle and share this info with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just throw out there that, uh, you know, I've been involved in uh, setting up the five E's, including education, uh, programming and Tucson and Calgary, and it's often an afterthought. Um, there's definitely not enough resources that go towards it. Uh, one of the programs we had in Tucson that was pretty fun and impactful was we had a magician and a traffic coloring guide. Um, and basically, it had a bunch of really good handy messages to educate third graders and this magician would go out and, you know, and hit up 20 to 50 schools a year and put on a magic show, but teach them about traffic safety. And I think there's a real opportunity to also weave in uh, climate change or just awareness about the environmental issues at the same time you're doing that traffic talk. Um, of course, you know, those nonprofits that do that type of education can't operate for free. So we need to devote some resources to that too, but it's uh, very cheap uh, compared to building an interchange. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add that, um, yeah, cycling education is something that a lot of um, have fallen to the cities to fund. Um, I think that's another area the province should be providing more resources to fund. In uh, the city of Vancouver, uh, mm -hmm. up until recently, we've only been able to fund a few schools per year for cycling education. As of this year, uh, we're doing 37 schools this year and then 36 schools next year for all grades six and sevens. Um, so that's a major expansion for us and um, it, it takes resources, right, to be able to uh, um, reach all of those schools. And so, yeah, that's another area I would love to you know, call out to the provincial government, government for more support in. 
and make it even as part of our um, school curriculum. I think that's really important. Well, I'll echo all that. And back in Bordeaux, right in the park, as I was explaining, they had a, like a section of the park with mini roads <laughs> and they had it staffed and the school groups came through and that, that was phenomenal. And then uh, I just read in our paper that the West Kootenai, uh, there's, there's a grade four or five program for teaching cycling safety. And, but it's absolutely essential. And now I do see with e-bikes and younger bike riders, especially here on our Nelson Hills, that uh, bikes used to be kind of slow, but now they're whipping up the hill. And uh, there, there really does need to be education uh, associated. I mean, maybe even the bike shops can help with that. Certainly Hub and West Kootenai Cycling Coalition and, and the biking uh, organizations are promoting education. Thank you all. Um, moving on to the next question I have here. Um, I may just skip a couple if I feel like they may have been already answered, if that all right. If, if you feel like your question has been answered, please just put it in the queue again. Um, so this one question by Mina Lee Johnstone. So, ah. So why are people still driving? Why are we still so auto-centric? When will the governments make drivers pay to drive? I mean, uh, I wish, I wish, I wish we were, I wish we were uh, using more active transportation. <laughs> I can yeah. take a stab at that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a very, very, Big question, complicated question, and I think it speaks to a lot of different things of how our system is set up. Um, of course, our, our land use um, often does not, it's not supportive of active transportation when things are very spread out. You have, you know, when you live um, several kilometers from your school, it's much more convenient for kids to be dropped off by car. Um, so there's that, that big, big piece. Um, and I've also noticed that a lot of people who are vocal on coming to council meetings and things like that are people who have the means to do that to, you know, they have the time. And uh, so usually they're not the ones who are working multiple jobs and um, they don't have to worry about, get, you know, getting to their kids and, and, and to and their jobs at the same time. So I think um, the way our, political system is structured right now doesn't allow us to hear from everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So that is part, I think that's also part of the, the issue. I just wanna add about parking because especially here in our rural areas, there's a lot of parking, parking's free, parking is easy. And I think that that's a place to start addressing. Yeah, and when I, when I talked about the tipping point for Vancouver, I think regionally we're much further behind. Uh, so just thinking of Metro Vancouver, we've got a great SkyTrain network, but when I've worked with those communities that have the stations, uh, the, the infrastructure a kilometer out, like if you do a radius, is usually non-existent, like really poor sidewalks, no bike lanes and definitely no protected infrastructure and multiple travel lanes and sometimes surrounded by highways. And yeah, those communities need to step up their game and uh, just be super committed to it. But, uh, you know, same thing, it's gonna come down to having the right political leaders with a vision that just push forward. And, and a lot of these communities also have outdated policies that still, you know, uh, still, still allow wiggle room uh, and, and probably over-prioritize the storage and moving of automobiles over the other modes. Thank you all for tackling complex question. These are all fantastic points you've all raised and I definitely see them as, I see them in my work all the time. Um, so moving on to, so I might just finish with one last question as we're hitting 525. Um, so this one is from Connie. 
Um, Castlegar has a lot of random benches and few kilometers of bike lanes. However, it is on a busy main road with little to no buffer from vehicle noise and pollution. Question, does anyone have an example of where these are addressed? So I'm thinking that probably might tie into maybe needing to provide more protected facilities and just maybe providing a bit of a buffer, which could be, I guess, some tree or some street furniture to, I guess, bring more, provide more of a comfortable facility. But I can just chip in that the the um, the trail between Euclid and Tofino has been built. So it's a separated trail completely distant from the road. And it's really a popular, I mean, these things are expensive, but it's a, that was a narrow, dangerous road with lots of windy bits. So it's a much loved trail up there. That's one way of doing it. I, I will say, Connie, from Castlegar, that's very exciting because we have that vision to go from Castlegar Station to Nelson Station. So uh, perhaps in our feasibility study, some of these points will be addressed, but I don't have anything for you yet. <laughs> And, Are you there? Okay. Oh, yes, I am still here. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. And hopefully Connie can look forward to that in the future. So with that, um, I think we're going to just uh, wrap up our Q&A session. Um, just uh, again, just want to make note that we have a petition. Maybe Guy might want to reiterate the action steps once again. Yeah, so um, I want to say more than that. I want to say thank you so much to you, Mona, for, for, for hosting us and being our MC to our guests, Patricia, Patricia, Iona, and Thomas, and to everyone who's big, taken part in all this. The um, petitions in the chat, we'll also send it round to you in a follow up email to everyone who's attended. And let's get the numbers up so that when we actually meet with the minister um, in July, probably, we got some good numbers to look at because it's less than, you know, 20 million is a miserable, less than 1% of the transportation budget is miserable. We can't get what we need with that kind of numbers, right? In the Nimo regional, in the Nimo, they set a goal to double cycling. Sounds great by 2030, from 2% to 4%. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's not good enough. Anyway, look, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us. And we will send information around about our next webinar on the second Wednesday in May, when we're looking at um, vehicular traffic, starting with car sharing, um, cargo bikes, electric vehicles, knowing that they are the third option after transit and active transportation. So thanks for everyone and enjoy the evening. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mona. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.